Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Arapitas here on behalf of the marketing team at School Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and participating in our Treating an Opioid Overdose with OTC Narcan webinar. Joining us today is Dr. Josh Pruitt. Josh has, Josh has had firsthand experience treating drug abuse in patients, especially in his home state of Iowa. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And we would also like to thank everyone who has joined today as well. Before I turn the time over to Josh, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. We will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit your questions via the questions interface tab in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. We will answer questions in the order that they were received at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and a link to it will be posted on the schoolhealth.com website. We will also email the link to you for future playback. In that same email, everyone who attends today's webinar will also be receiving a certificate of attendance for joining us. This email will come from School Health, not GoToWebinar. If you are having technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9003. That number once again is 855-352-9003. With that being said, let's turn the time over to Josh. Thank you, Alex. Um, I just want to say how honored I am to be able to present this uh, this to you all. I, um, I'm coming to you from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where I'm an emergency physician. I'm also an EMS physician, uh, medical director for several different EMS agencies, and work as a medical examiner um, here locally in my county and in a neighboring county. So that's kind of uh, a little bit of my background. Um, but I'm just thrilled to be able to kind of get some of this information out there. So um, we, we do have um, a few objectives today. One is to look at some of the emerging trends uh, or trends in emerging drugs of abuse, what's out there, what, uh, what you might see even in your own schools. Talk a little bit about the history of the opioid epidemic, what, um, what has led us to the point where we are today and um, and how we may see a, a path forward here. Um, we're going to look at uh, the role of reversal agents, which is really the primary thrust of this whole presentation um, and this whole education um, time is to talk about the use of naloxone or Narcan and how we apply that in opiate overdose. And my goal is that you will leave here empowered to make a difference in someone's life, whether it's a student whether it's someone in your own home, whether it's a coworker, um, uh, a spectator at a sporting event, uh, there's just all kinds of different uh, potential applications for this. And so hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully this will give you that information that you need to leave here feeling like you're empowered to, to make that difference. A couple of disclaimers as we get started. One is that I am not a psychiatrist. I am, uh, I am uh, an emergency physician, so um, I do not claim to have psychiatric expertise. Um, I also uh, am not an addiction specialist, so I do not uh, I do not have um, specific additional training in in addiction medicine. So um, those are very specialized training programs, and that is not that is not my background. So you might um, legitimately and reasonably be asking how how did I end up here? How did I end up talking about this? topic and and really that comes down to a couple of things that happened early in my career as i finished residency um, i started in emergency medicine and then uh, became uh, a, a medical examiner for lynn county where cedar rapids is located as well as cedar county next door and through my work as a medical examiner i was seeing a lot of overdose deaths and began to be asked um, to to be an expert witness so I was retained as an expert witness on opiate overdoses in 2012 by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Iowa. So I focused my, my expert witness testimony on the effects of opiates and the use of naloxone and that sort of thing. And so as, as this medical examiner uh, position um, led to me seeing many overdose deaths and then into this expert witness role, um, that became something that I was very interested in. So I've, I've gone out and done some, some of my own, um, just my own training, um, gotten some additional um, uh, CME training in the area of um, 
of drug abuse and and addiction medicine, but I am not uh, I'm not by any means the expert in it, and uh, I don't want to portray myself as that. So. Um, let's go ahead and start with just an overview, a broad overview of teen, uh, of teen drug use. How big is the problem really? Well, in the past month, 2 million uh, teenagers across the country, uh, eight, a little over 8% of teenagers uh, statistically have used some sort of substance. About 84% of those that used substances used marijuana. Uh, but another half million or, or almost 600,000 uh, students used something other than marijuana. Um, these statistics get, get really personal for me. I have an eighth grader um, and, and almost 9% of eighth graders have used drugs in the last month. That's essentially, you know, one out of 10, 11, 12, something like that. And 21% uh, of eighth graders have tried drugs at least once in their life. By the time a, a student gets to their senior year of high school, almost half of them have tried drugs of some, uh, of some sort. Um, we look at overdoses um, and overdose deaths, uh, almost 5,000 overdose deaths in, um, in these, this adolescent and young adult age group uh, occurred in 2019. Um, of those people who die uh, between the ages of 15 and 24, 11% of those people die as a result of a drug overdose. In the past year, um, again, we're looking at teenagers. Um, in the last year, 13% have used marijuana. Another half percent or so have used cocaine. 0.17% uh, have used meth. Um, a, a little bit, uh, a very small percentage have used heroin, although it's very difficult to get accurate numbers on that. And almost 3%, 2.5% have used um, pain relievers inappropriately. Now that might be pain relievers they were prescribed for a legitimate injury or surgery. That may also be um, pain relievers that they've gotten from a family member, uh, something left over in grandma's medicine cabinet, that sort of thing. Um, again, just a, a graphical representation of this problem. Here's the 4,777 overdose deaths. The green line here represents the opiate deaths, which is really what we're gonna key in on toward the end of this talk. And again, you see that um, these overdose deaths had an overall kind of upward trend um, since 99. And then in 2017, we had a big drop off into 2018 and we started climbing again in 2019. Um, that's the most recent um, statistics we have from this Nas National Center for Drug Abuse Statistics. Um, but we know that, that life didn't get easier for anyone between between 2020 and and now with the COVID epidemic and that sort of thing and so um, we know that across the board overdose deaths have increased during the COVID period and um, it would stand a reason that the, that increase also occurred in our in our young adults and adolescents so um, it is definitely a, a battle that we are fighting um, and and really struggling to get the upper hand in at this point. Um, just to touch briefly on alcohol, um, that, that is excluded from the other drug statistics that I just talked through, uh, but about 5% of, of uh, teenagers have binge drank in the last month. That's a little over a million teenagers that binge drank in the last month. Um, and more than a quarter of, of these teenagers who drank uh, have drunk alcohol at all in the past month. That's over 7 million teenagers across the country that have had some sort of alcohol in the last month. Uh, a quarter of eighth graders have abused alcohol at least once in their life. And over 60% of teenagers have abused alcohol by the time they're in 12th grade. Of those of you, those of you who work in high schools, um, almost 3% of your seniors in high school will drink on a daily basis. And of those who drink on a daily basis, um, it's almost 17% of them will have five drinks in a row or more when they drink. So um, they, they're, they're drinking daily and they're, they're binge drinking when they do drink. So again, this, um, this idea of, of drug abuse and substance use in our teen population, it is, it is definitely there. It's definitely prevalent. Um, one of the things that I hope you gain from this is the awareness that it's there and, and maybe some insight into how you might um, be able to approach it, how you might be able to see it and, and see the warning signs of it. Um, something else that I, I like to say a lot uh, to people is that everyone is important 
but no one is special. Um, so this, these statistics cut across all socioeconomic classes. They cut across race, they cut across gender, they cut across um, folks that have um, high schools in, in um, urban uh, environments to rural environments. It really, it, cu it cuts across all of these, um, all of these different demographics. So um, your school is also struggling uh, when it comes to substance use and abuse. Um, there's clearly going to be some regional variability where I am in Iowa. Um, our opiate overdose deaths are, are bad, but not, not nearly like we would see the amount of abuse of methamphetamines. We see a lot more methamphetamine use in Iowa than we do um, opiates. So there will be some regional variability, but no one is escaping the statistics of drug abuse, whether you're, um, whether you're in an affluent area or a poor area, urban, rural, um, race, no, no racial uh, differences. It's all, it's, it's going to be there. And so again, my hope is that when we, when we're done today, that you've got some ideas of, of how to recognize it and intervene before it becomes uh, something that's really problematic for these teenagers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about things that are new, things that are kind of emerging on the scene. Um, so there's, there's four or five uh, specific substances I'd like to touch on, um, xylazine, metanidazine, or other nidazines, um, metragenine, um, which is becoming a pretty significant issue here in Iowa, and then all the fentanyl um, issues as well. So if we look first at xylazine, xylazine is really designed to be a veterinary sedative or analgesic. It um, first started appearing in the early 2000s in heroin adulterant as a heroin adulterant, uh, meaning it wasn't really supposed to be in the heroin, but it was ending up in the heroin that we, that was coming into the country, uh, into the mainland country uh, out of Puerto Rico. But then um, by the 2010s, it was being used as a standalone drug. Um, the highest rates of use of xylazine are in the Northeast U.S. Uh, Philadelphia continues to lead the nation in xylazine. And um, over in 2020, over 25%, uh, more than a quarter of the overdose deaths in Philadelphia were due to xylazine. You have probably seen news articles about this. It's called Trank or a zombie drug, Trank Dope. Um, and it's still, as of August, uh, at least, is, is the most recent information I could find. Um, it's not scheduled by the DEA, which means that it doesn't have the same regulatory guidelines that some of our other drugs of abuse or illicit substances have. And so there's less ability to regulate it on a federal level <clears throat> because it's not yet scheduled. Um, there is an import ban by the FDA or an import alert which um, limits the ability to legally move the substance across country lines, um, but clearly uh, keep it, keeping things out of the country is, is challenging. Um, and so uh, we've, got, we've got that um, working against us as well. This is not an opiate, so we'll talk a little bit about op how opiates work later on here, but, uh, but naloxone, the Narcan that you're going to be more familiar with, does not work on this. But the clinical picture of someone who is, has overdosed or has used xylazine is similar to an opiate. They become sedated. They'll have some amnesia to the event. They'll have slowed or absent breathing. Uh, so it looks a lot like an opiate overdose. And most people are using more than one substance if they're using xylazine. So they're using fentanyl in addition to their xylazine. So there still may be an application for naloxone. It just doesn't work specifically on the xylazine. One of the more common things that gets reported in the news with xylazine is these gross necrotic wounds. This picture is of a, a, a young patient who has a necrotic xylazine or a trank ulcer on their on their arm. And, uh, and what happens is that when you use the xylazine, when you inject it, it causes vasoconstriction or constriction of the blood vessels around the site of injection. And when those blood vessels constrict down, um, you don't get blood flow to the skin like you would like to, and so the skin begins to break down because there's not um, there's not enough uh, blood flow to the skin. So xylazine is certainly being more and more used in the community, and 
what happens in the community does eventually cross over into school-aged uh, kids, especially high schoolers. So um, certainly something that you may already be seeing um, or will, will be seeing in the future. Metanidazine is considered a new synthetic opioid. Um, it was actually first synthesized in the 1950s. So those of you who, who were potentially born in the 50s, that, uh, that makes you new. So uh, good news. And um, the research around metanidazine was actually abandoned because 20% of patients in, in one study um, experienced um, low oxygen levels and respiratory depression when it was being used in what was thought to be therapeutic dosing. So all of the adverse events caused them to abandon the research. Again, this is primarily in uh, the Northeast and, and unfortunately Philadelphia again leads the race with, um, with the use of metanidazine. It started really showing up on the streets in, in 2020 and began to be seen frequently in overdose deaths by the end of 2020. Um, metanidazine has been implicated in overdose deaths across the country. Um, I've had at least a handful of metanidazine deaths here in Eastern Iowa as well. So it certainly um, is, is kind of moving across the country. This drug does act at the opiate receptor. So naloxone should be effective um, at, at preventing the effects from it. Something that we're dealing with a lot here is metragenine or kratom. Um, kratom is derived from a plant. Um, it is ground, uh, the leaves are dried and ground into a green powder. Um, and it's being now marketed as a, as a supplement. And it's very much legal to buy over the counter. Um, so, it, and it's all natural. So um, many people feel that all natural things are, are good to use. Uh, I like to remind people that there are a lot of things that are natural that are also very frightening, like grizzly bears. So, so Kratom may not be the answer that you're looking for, but it has been used um, in uh, Eastern medicine for cough and diarrhea, high blood pressure, muscle pains, that sort of thing. It's, tended, it's, it's intended uses to be placed into smoothies or teas, and it um, it does work at the opioid receptor, but the clinical picture doesn't look like an opiate overdose. Um, it tends to cause more agitation, alertness, psychosis. Um, they may be hallucinating, um, uh, having nausea and vomiting, dry mouth, constipation, increased urination, vomiting, drowsiness, loss of appetite, weight loss, insomnia, liver toxicity, seizures. I mean, it makes it sound like a great drug to do. Um, what people are using it for is that kind of kick, that boost of alertness, um, and to have the, the feelings of euphoria that you can get with it as well. Um, it has been implicated in overdoses, but it's very difficult to assign it as the cause of death. So um, again, it works at the opioid receptors, so naloxone should be helpful. This gives you just a little bit of an idea of the way that it's being marketed, um, you can clearly use it as um, as a pre-mixed dietary supplement tea. That's this one is flavored as crisp apple. Um, it's sold in head shops or other places, um, just over the counter, uh, multiple different uh, flavors that you can get it in online. You can buy it as well from uh, multiple different kratom vendors. I looked here locally in Cedar Rapids to see what um, what we could could buy and these are all places locally that sell kratom um, and there's if you're curious there's a website that you can say where can i buy kratom locally and it will it will bring up your city that is my fair city of cedar rapids there on the left and this is the uh this is these are the different places that you can purchase kratom in town um, we have a patient that frequently comes to our emergency department who um, who is uh, housing insecure um, and he often is covered in kratom powder uh, and he's very aggressive and agitated when he comes in and we kind of recognize him for for that um, so it's definitely out there and because it is legal and really unregulated um, definitely something that you might uh, see in in schools as well so um, and then we're going to transition at this point into talking a little more about the opiates in particular um, and we'll cover we'll cover fentanyl in a little more detail and how we address those issues uh, with overdose of the opiates um, 
a group called Let's Face Heroin several years ago, this is this video is about eight years old, put out a video um, that I think really describes the the signs of drug use very clearly, and I, I really can't do a better job of it than they did. So um, it's about two and a half minutes. So we'll watch this video, and then on the other side of that, we'll talk in a little more detail about the opiates. So again, um, I feel like that really shows the um, the signs of, of drug use very well, um, from the behavioral to the physical signs, um, whether that's a student in your school, whether that's someone, uh, could even be someone, unfortunately, in your own home, um, just the ability to kind of see what signs there are that there could be some drug use there and the ability to intervene early i think is is critically important um uh, that's going to play again my bad let me there we go all right so opiates come in many forms um it could be oral injectable topical inhalational you can insufflate it which is snorting it so there's many different forms um, oral and injectable tend to be the most common of abuse. Uh, certainly, um, people can uh, do a lot of snorting of these medications as well. Um, in regards to the epidemic, um, let's kind of talk about how we ended up where we are. <clears throat> it's a sad story. Um, there's not a there's not a happy ending, and we honestly don't really know how we walk out the end of this story. Um, but but it started um, back in the 1980s with some very well-intentioned researchers who basically um, looked at inpatients, patients in the hospital and said that patients who received pain medications while they were hospitalized for painful conditions had no higher incidence of addiction um, than, than the general population. 
And that is clearly targeting a very small sub subset of people. It's people who are inpatient who received a dose of pain medications. Um, through some bad science and corporate greed of, of people at places like Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, um, they took this, this initial research um, that was done by, by some folks and they really began to twist the meaning and say, see, look, people get pain medicines and they're no more likely to be addicted than the general population. And they began to generalize that information out to, to everyone. Uh, and clearly this research was intended only for these hospitalized patients. And so um, they recognized the ability to make a lot of money off of this. Um, you know, Purdue Pharma initially started out as a, as a, um, as a pharmaceutical company for uh, producing medications for constipation. Um, and very quickly when they developed OxyContin, um, they were able to increase the value of their company uh, by, by hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they ran some very good PR. Um, they recruited some physicians to record videos. Um, for those of you who are uh, uh, of a, maybe a little bit uh, older age, um, in, their, in their middle age like me, you remember what a VHS tape was. They actually made VHS tapes and sent them out to primary care physicians all across the country, touting the benefits of starting patients on these pain medications um, and stating that they had no additional increased risk of addiction. We figured out in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, that we were really hurting people by, by starting them on these medications. And so there were some reactionary regulations that were put in place that basically limited the ability of physicians to prescribe these medications for people. And because of these reactionary regulations, many physicians just cut people off. And so when you take someone who has now become dependent and or addicted to a medication, and th then you cut them off, um, they're gonna look for answers somewhere because withdrawing from opiates is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, it, you, you can describe it as the worst influenza, uh, case of influenza of your life, um, and that really doesn't do it justice. Um, it's very painful. Um, your skin begins to actually hurt. Um, you begin, you develop nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and, and body aches and, um, and irritability, and it's difficult to live with you as a family member or a friend. And so people will look for answers not to get high, but just to get rid of that feeling. Um, that feeling is called uh, being dope sick on the street. And so they, they, they're going to withdraw, they feel dope sick and they're gonna look for answers. And so people who had been prescribed these medications began to look for, sub, for substances on the street. And so they would buy things that they thought were oxycodone. Um, they would quickly transition to heroin, that sort of thing. And then um, drug manufacturers, uh, the illicit of the illicit kind, um, really are unrestrained capitalists. They see an ability to make money. They recognize that if they switch their product up a little bit, they can make it for the same, they can make the product for the same amount, but sell it for much more. And so rather than making heroin, they begin to um, put fentanyl in it. And because fentanyl has uh, a much smaller volume of medication that's required to give you the same feeling, um, they could sell the same weight of medication that cost them the same amount to make for, for a lot more money. And so this unrestrained capitalism now has led us into this fentanyl epidemic. Um, and, and it really, you can kind of trace this train all the way back to the engine, um, which was these well-intentioned researchers that published a paper that they never intended to be used in the way it was used to support um, just prescribing these medications uh, without real restraint. We, we, we have to remind ourselves that people who use heroin and really other substances, approximately 80% of the people who misuse uh, or abuse opiates started out with a prescription. They started out with a prescription that they began to misuse. And so, um, so really, so much of the responsibility for this epidemic really lies in the house of medicine. And so that's one of the reasons I'm so, so excited about getting this information out is that 
we bear some of the responsibility for for this epidemic even occurring in the first place and so we can now get this information out there to try to combat some of the things that we did back in the 80s and 90s um so just just keep that in mind that these are people um who become addicted to a medication that maybe they were legitimately prescribed and then they start looking at other places how does that affect school age kids well when there's more and more product on the streets um there's it's more and more likely to make it into the into the, your adolescent ages as well and so um, i'm not suggesting that adolescents necessarily started with prescription drug and then transitioned over to illicit substances um, but the reason there are so many illicit substances on the streets right now is because of this sudden withdrawal of uh, prescription medications from the market and then they began to look on the black market for them um, the the timelines really match up with that very well also so you can see this um, this uh, prescription over overdose deaths um, in about 2010 is when we began to regulate the prescription industry or the physicians in how much they could prescribe and so in 2010 all of a sudden you see this uptick we'd had this fairly low heroin uh, death rate that gold line for quite a while and then in 2010 we see this up uptick of um, of heroin deaths about three years later, this is when the drug dealers got smart um, and said, I can make uh, fentanyl cheaper than I can make heroin and I can sell it for more. And so these illicit um, synthetic substances began being produced in 2013. And you really see those overdose deaths take off. And that graph has sort of uh, plateaued, but still um, we see more deaths from fentanyl and other synthetic opioids than we do from from prescriptions now um, again you can see this in the in another graph here um, where you've got this number of fentanyl um, deaths in the nflis database um, and then starting in 2013 from 2013 we went from under a thousand deaths nationwide to, due to fentanyl to 7,000. Um, uh, or uh, these weren't deaths these were just overdose cases in the nflis um, database uh, and then up to 13,000. So, I mean, you, it's just climbing rather dramatically there, um, starting in 2013. Which brings us to the, how do we intervene? Um, and so you're going to be seeing more and more and more of this. Naloxone is now available over the counter. Um, and many, many uh, resources are, are out there for patients to be able to get naloxone and for um, other uh, institutions to be able to get naloxone. This is something that is uh, is something that I think you will see more and more commonly within your schools. Those of you who are school nurses will ha certainly have access to this uh, in the coming months and years, I believe. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, naloxone or Narcan is the brain, brand name, and we'll look at the uh, the applicator, how you administer it, and really who you're going to administer it to. I think it helps a lot to understand how naloxone works so that it so that you can kind of see the if you understand the how I think that the why then makes a lot more sense. So um, this is a pretty simple um, common illustration that I see with with opiates and naloxone. So you have an outlet that's your cell. OK, so that is you're you're wanting that cell to to have a certain change inside it uh, based on a response to a drug the only way things change inside a cell is through receptors on the cell membrane on the cell surface so um, you have an opioid receptor uh, on the cell surface that can then be activated by an opiate like fentanyl or other opiates and when that thing is plugged in, then you get this intracellular change and you get the effects that you want. Whether I give a lot of fentanyl in the emergency department to people for who have uh, fractures or other painful conditions, and I'm looking for pain relief uh, and that sort of thing. And I can get that because the fentanyl acts at the opioid receptor. Every receptor has a certain affinity for the thing that is going to bind to it. So. Um, this opioid receptor has an affinity for fentanyl. Fortunately for us, um, we can exploit the fact that those opioid receptors have a higher affinity for naloxone than they do for fentanyl. 
So that means they like to bind to naloxone more than they like to bind to fentanyl. So they act as one of those child safety um, outlet covers where they can plug into the receptor, keep it from being used, and then, um, and then you don't have the effects of the opiate. They can also actually push the fentanyl off of the receptor and block the receptor because that receptor prefers to be bound to the naloxone as opposed to the fentanyl. It has a higher affinity for that naloxone. So if there's fentanyl in place or another opiate on that receptor and you give the patient naloxone, naloxone is able to push that, um, push that opiate off the receptor, cover it up and keep it from being used. And so you can see the effects of the naloxone be revert or the effects of the opiate be reversed because you've given naloxone to the patient. So I want to take a, um, a second here and just show you what the Narcan administration administrators, the nasal sprays look like and kind of how they'll come packaged. So um, they come in a package like this. Um, there'll be there'll be two of these in a box usually. And so you just, this is an expired one that we um, have here with our EMS agency that I um, am using for demonstration purposes, but you just peel the back of it off and it comes with instructions. In the moment of crisis, you're probably not going to need those. Um, these are really self-explanatory. So um, it's just a nasal spray, um, finger on either side, thumb on the pump, you put it into one nostril, you give the whole thing in one nostril. Um, you don't need to split it between both. You can just push it once and activate it and, and it sprays into their nostril. And then you'll see that the plunger actually collapses. So it can't be pushed again. There's nothing else in there. Okay. Um, a few questions that I sometimes get regarding the Narcan. Um, one is, well, what if the patient is so unresponsive that they're no longer breathing? Um, remember that, um, that they're not actually inhaling Narcan into their lungs in order for it to work. So they don't have to breathe it in. What they need to do is they need to have the Narcan in their bloodstream. So this is just a device to get the medication as close to the bloodstream as possible. So, um, when the medication is used in a nasal spray form, it is sprayed onto the mucosa of the um, of the nose. So that's that mucus lining of the nose and the blood vessels are very close to the surface there. And so as long as there is a pulse, then the Narcan can be picked up by the bloodstream as it flows by and carried to where it needs to go. So it's all it's, it's always able to be given whether they're breathing or not. If they have a pulse, they can distribute this Narcan around their system. Um, so let's say you come up on an unresponsive person. One of the classic things is um, uh, that you come into a, a bathroom and you find someone unresponsive in a stall. Well, you don't know why they're unresponsive. So you're going to do your typical CPR response of, you know, the Annie, Annie, are you okay? And then you're looking for chest rise, you're looking for a pulse, and you're calling 911, just like you always do um, for someone who's unresponsive. And if they don't have a pulse, you're beginning CPR. Okay, so that's nothing, nothing changes with that response. What this is, is this is an additional um, tool in your arsenal to be able to treat the person. So um, my recommendation is that if you come upon someone who's unresponsive and you've gone down this pathway, um, you've done the CPR response, maybe they have a pulse, but they're still not responding to you, administer the naloxone. If you're able to, uh, under your own um, systems protocols, if you're able to check a blood sugar, check a blood sugar, right? This is some, someone could be unresponsive because their blood sugar is 20. Naloxone doesn't fix that, um, uh, so we'll, we'll have to, you have to address that in a different way, but go ahead and administer the naloxone spray. It isn't going to hurt them. Um, side effects of naloxone are very, um, are very poorly documented, honestly. Um, we don't have a lot of, of documented uh, adverse events with naloxone. Um, there is 
there are some case reports occasionally of people who have been on very high dose infusions of naloxone for a long period of time that um, they might get uh, pulmonary edema or fluid in the lungs as a result of being on high dose um, IV infusions of naloxone. But from a single administrated dose of naloxone, it's very unlikely. So um, once you give the naloxone, what should you expect? Well, one thing you should expect is that naloxone gets broken down by the body more quickly than most other opiates. So going back to that plug analogy, if the, um, if the child protective cover gets broken down and the fentanyl is still there, it can plug back in. So they may honestly require a second dose of naloxone. By that point, hopefully, EMS has arrived and they're already on the way to the hospital and you shouldn't have to necessarily re-dose re a person. But if you give someone a dose of naloxone nasal spray and they wake up and they seem to be doing well and then they start to become unresponsive again, it's probably time for a second dose. You may cause them to go into acute opiate withdrawal. In other words, they may not like you very much. They could come up being angry, um, being um, in pain, um, they can vomit, those sorts of things. And so you may actually cause acute opiate withdrawal by giving them nalo the naloxone. Now, withdrawal is uncomfortable, but withdrawal from an opiate doesn't kill people. Um, being sedated, over sedated from an opiate does. So it's better to give this and ask for forgiveness than it is to not do anything. Um, typically, they just wake up confused and they always deny that they took anything. Um, so don't be surprised when that happens. If you're able to, try to roll them to the side after you give it um, into a recovery position just to protect their airway in case they vomit, that sort of thing. Another big question is, am I safe? As a responder, am I safe? And you see these headlines, right? That nurses are revived with Narcan after an opioid patient was treated in the hospital. Officer accidentally overdoses after fentanyl exposure. Uh, lots of accidental exposures. And so, it's tough to know. Sometimes people avoid helping because they, they feel that they may be exposed to an opiate. We have to remember that exposure doesn't equal toxicity, meaning that you can be exposed to something and not be toxic. Um, the other, the, a few months ago, I uh, had a vial of fentanyl break while I was in a helicopter treating a patient, and I got, um, I got fentanyl, injectable fentanyl, on my skin. Didn't get any, I was exposed to it, but I didn't get any toxicity from it. Um, most of the routes of exposure that are reported in the media are skin exposure or inhalational exposure. If, um, if you covered both palms of, with fentanyl patches um, and wanted to get a 100 microgram dose of fentanyl, it would take you 14 minutes to do that. And those pa patches have to be specially formulated to, to, to actually absorb through the skin. Um, 100 microgram dose is, um, is around our normal dose uh, that we give to someone for pain control. Uh, as far as inhalation, the powder is really difficult to aerosolize unless you've weaponized it. Um, it has a low vapor pressure, which means that it doesn't vaporize easily, and, and so you would need hours of exposure. Um, the symptoms of the exposure and the toxic to toxicity need to match what we know it should be. So if it, with an opioid toxicity, again, we kind of saw this in the video, small pupils, central nervous system, depression, respiratory depression. When we see the videos of people who are um, allegedly exposed to an opiate and, and having side effects, we see dizziness, lightheadedness, numbness, palpitations, chest pain, hyperventilation, um, sometimes you can see it in the video that their pupils are really large that doesn't really match with what we know to be the toxidrome from opiates so it it, it it's somewhat questionable that that's actually what's causing their symptoms um if they're giving themselves naloxone they probably didn't need it um, people who need naloxone are the ones who are unresponsive and can't protect themselves if you can self-administer the naloxone you don't really need it so we don't have any confirmed cases in, a, in the toxicology literature of people who have been accidentally occupationally exposed to an opiate and have had an overdose from it. Um, people ask about, well, what about carfentanil and some of these other really potent drugs? And they have the same absorption properties. However, so that's, that's I put that out there to say, you're going to be okay. 
However, if you're concerned, gloves and an N95 mask or even a simple mask are going to protect you in an addition with an additional layer. And if that if that gives you more comfort in caring for the patient, I say do it um, because ultimately we want you to feel comfortable intervening in these crisis situations. And so if there's any hesitancy to jump in and to, to do what needs to be done for the patient, throw on gloves and a mask and you should be good to go at that point. There is a, a website dedicated to sort of combating the uh, misinformation that's out there in regards to accidental exposure. It's called WT Fentanyl. Um, and they've put, uh, produced a, the, the form here on the left. There's um, even more available on their website at wtfentanyl.com. And I would encourage you to look at that as well. Um, included in here are some references for you on some of the emerging drugs of abuse uh, so that you can look into that more if you'd be interested in doing so. And then I don't mind at all um, if you email me um, and have questions. You can certainly, obviously, submit your questions through the GoToWebinar uh, platform, but I don't mind um, responding to emails. Uh, it may not be the next day, but I don't mind responding to emails at any point should you have any questions. Again, um, I hope that this is helpful to you. I hope that you feel that you can um, make a difference for these patients. Um, and honestly, it may not be a student. It might be a coworker. It might be someone who is on um, the maintenance staff. It might be someone who is at a sporting event, but having someone around who knows what naloxone is and knows how to administer it can really save a life. And, and going home at the end of the day, knowing that you saved a life is a, is a, a really amazing feeling. So I hope you can uh, have that feeling sometime. Um, and I hope that you feel that you've got the knowledge to be able to intervene uh, in these crisis situations. So don't just stand there. Um, uh, you can intervene in the crisis. Thanks. And have a great day. Thank you, Josh. That was very impactful and covered a lot of information. We appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Uh, we do have some questions that we received during the presentation, so let's take uh, some time to address these. First question is from Laura, and she is asking, can anyone carry Naxalone or is a prescription from a doctor needed? So naloxone just recently became over the counter. So anyone can have this um, on their on their in their possession um, with no prescription required from the physician. So uh, it's able to be out in the community even more. Thank you. Um, next question is from Sherry, and she is asking if Narcan will always work to reverse an opioid opioid overdose. Or are there some instances where the overdose cannot be reversed or possibly needs more, like it's just not being effective in the moment? Right, right. So there's, there's for, for the vast majority of opioid, opiate overdoses, yes, naloxone will work. There's a couple of kind of caveats to that. One is that some of the more potent um, opiates may require higher than normal doses of uh, naloxone. So I have had people come into the emergency department who have received four milligrams, which is what the um, nasal spray is, is four milligrams of naloxone. They've received that four milligrams. It didn't work. It didn't make a change in their clinical picture. But when I'll give escalating doses of eight, 10, 12 milligrams of, of naloxone, I'll get a response. So that's one instance. So uh, the other instance is really, it's a timing issue. If a patient has been unresponsive for long enough and had a, a low enough respiratory rate where they're not getting um, good oxygen uh, flow or oxygen to the, to the tissues, um, they may suffer an injury to the brain that's just not reversible because of the low oxygen levels for an extended period of time. So the naloxone may not be effective in that instance because of the timing. So really that's one of the reasons that we want this out in the public is because it may take time for a professional to get to the patient, but if we can have lay people who can administer this medication or school nurses or whomever, if we can have people that can administer this, administer this drug to people who are in a crisis, that saves their life in the, in the short term for them, to, for us to be able to get them to the hospital and address things more, uh, more when they get there. So those would be the two bit main instances when the naloxone might not work. And that's actually a good uh, segue into the next question because we have uh, 
people asking if any training is necessary to use Narcan. Like any bystander can just grab it, open it, stick it up someone's nose and you use it. Yeah, so um, I mean, so if you go to pick this up at the pharmacy, um, a lot of times it'll, it's over the counter, but a lot of times it'll be behind the counter and the pharmacist will talk you through kind of how to use it. Um, but honestly, if if someone, it, these are these are pretty simple to use. So if a bystander happened to have it or someone has it in their purse and, or pocket and they don't know how to use it and another bystander th thinks they can do it, like anybody can do it. There's no specialized training. Now, um, Clearly that is, I'm speaking from a lay person out in the community sort of perspective, your institution, your school may have some specific guidelines that they want you to be trained um, in a certain way to, to use these, but, but no, there's no special training required at all. And I think you also hinted on this before as well, but you don't need to um, like test the spray before you use it on somebody. You just want to stick it in someone's nose and just engage the plunger so nothing is wasted, correct? Correct, correct. Um, I don't know if you um, noticed, but but when I pushed that plunger, the, the I don't know if you can see it on the video, but the spray came out and that's it. You get one shot. So there is no priming it. There's no anything like that. You just put it in and push it one time and the spray comes out and the plunger actually locks in place after you've, after you've pushed it. So it's done. All right, thank you. Um, for our next question is from uh, Karen asking, should you administer Naxalone even if you aren't positive that they took opioids? So will anything happen if, if you gave it to somebody? Um, is it okay if, if, it, in, if it gets into somebody's bloodstream? Right, so that's where um, if you come up upon an unresponsive person and you don't know why, why they're unresponsive, it is absolutely safe to administer naloxone. Um, again, there's very, very little um, documented as far as side effects from naloxone. It doesn't cause any harm that we know of. And let's say they're unresponsive from low blood sugar and you give them naloxone. It's not going to work, but it's not going to hurt them. Uh, so absolutely, um, I, I feel like I can endorse this totally of give it if you think that it could be a possibility. If you come up on an unresponsive person, it's totally okay to give it don't delay doing the other things, right? The the CPR stuff is most important. So you you come up on an unresponsive person, first thing you're going to do is look for chest rise, look for pulse, that sort of thing. But you can throw this into the mix very quickly, give it, and if it, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, no harm done. Thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Nick, and I think other people have touched on this question as well. Um, but Nick is asking, do opioids affect certain individuals more than others? And this is more relating to their, like their ethnicity, their genetic background, um, anything like that? Um, not, not to, not to, um, not to our knowledge. I mean, certainly different people can metabolize opiates in a different way. Um, there are some people like you. If you're given codeine, um, you have to convert, your body has to convert codeine to morphine in order for you to get any pain relief from it. And there's a subset of the population that genetically does not have the enzyme to convert codeine to morphine. So um, all you get from codeine is the nausea and vomiting, but no pain relief. So there are certainly interpersonal variabilities in how people respond, but it doesn't really fall neatly along any sort of ethnic or or gender or any of uh, age sort of lines. Um, now, if people have, um, have a history of using opiates routinely, even if they're not dependent or addicted, if they use opiates routinely, they tend to need higher doses in order to achieve the effect that, that you want. Um, but there's really, it just doesn't fall cleanly along the lines that we, that, that, that you might think there's no, there's no real difference in ethnicity or, or age or, or gender. Thank you. Uh, also, we are getting close to the end of the hour, just so you're aware. So we will probably get through a couple, few more questions. Um, our next question is from Jackie, who is asking, uh, would a student or an individual in general be arrested for drug possession if a bystander called 911 for an overdose? Um, so if you're, I think what this is asking is if, would the bystander be affected if they are 
walking in on somebody that is suffering from an overdose um, because I know there was issues with people just not calling 911 originally and I know some laws were created to protect somebody so you could save a life um, in a situation like this because the person does need medical treatment. Right, exactly. Um, you know, the law enforcement officers clearly um, have some latitude in how they interact with the public, um, but but certainly the responder, the one administering the naloxone, um, is is protected. There's not you you should not be getting into any trouble for administering it. Um, the the person who is using the opiates, um, I can really only speak to what happens here locally. Law enforcement officers here are not interested in um, prosecuting or arresting the the one who is the end user. Now they would love to go up the chain and and get the person who's manufacturing it um, or maybe one uh, one who's distributing it, um, but they're really not interested in um, in in prosecuting the one who's using it. And so um, there there is a lot of fear, um, and I understand that of people who use drugs. Um, who are fearful of the law enforcement involvement. Um, but ultimately, um, these people need medical care first. And so, so we always encourage, administer the naloxone, but go ahead and call 911. Let's get the, let's get the, um, the ambulance rolling so that we can get you to the hospital. We can make sure that things are okay. And then we have resources in the hospital to be able to plug people in for outpatient treatments, um, outpatient counseling, any of the any of the stuff that we can do to try to um, decrease their drug use in the future. So it that is the intersection of health and law is always challenging, um, but there has been a lot of progress on both sides, I think, to um, uh, trying not to put barriers in the way of these people getting the health care that they need. So thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Tammy, and she is asking, uh, where should Naxalone or Narcan um, be stored in schools? Like how many, uh, like how much should you have per students? So, you know, if you have a fire extinguisher in certain areas, an AED in certain areas, is there a general rule of how many you should have per students? I have not seen any research that indicates how many per student. In fact, getting naloxone into schools is a pretty new concept. And so I don't know that there's any research or studies out there to suggest exactly how much you would need. Um, there's probably going to be some regional difference differences depending on the rates of drug abuse and opiate abuse within the community in which the school um, is located. Um, I, I think it makes sense in my mind as just logically that if we can at some point get to the point that we have AED stop the bleed kit and Narcan all in one spot, that seems to make the most sense of knowing it, that way everybody knows where it is, everybody can get access to it and you can you can intervene then um, there's there's some pretty broad ranges of temperature where um, where the naloxone can be stored. But if you have uh, an AED and a stop the bleed kit at an outdoor football stadium and you're in the northern part of the country, these things can't freeze. So you got to um, you got to watch some of that. But those would be just some general thoughts I would have. But those that's Again, that's total opinion, and and there's not really, to my knowledge, there's not any specific research in that in that area that I know of. So, do you, would you recommend keeping the uh, Narcan like inside compared to outside, or like just to yeah. um, to get new ones more often if it's outside? Yeah. I it would, it would really depend on what temperature extremes they were exposed to outside. Um, I guess I always think of being in the north because I live in Iowa and it's starting to get cold here, but there's temperature extremes of heat as well that it shouldn't tolerate. And I, I don't know off the top of my head what those ranges are, but um, I can see, you know, Arizona, Florida, uh, some of those places, Texas getting to, um, to levels of heat that you probably wouldn't want this outdoors. Um, so, my recommendation would probably be that this stay indoors um, just from the from the temperature extremes standpoint. Okay, thank you. And that is actually all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. We hope you were able to take a lot out of the presentation and found the information useful. 
Uh, thank you again to, jo to Dr. Josh Pruitt for sharing all this important information with us. Uh, after you exit the webinar, you'll see a survey window. Please note that this survey will not appear on the recording. Uh, we would ask each of you to please take a moment for this brief survey and help us improve what we've done here today. That will end today's broadcast. Thank you all for joining us.